terrible for some reason. Uh, start it. There we go. Well, we're seeing there. your whole desktop, but that's okay. Okay, we'll fix that real quick. Um, you should have a present mode here. Okay. There we go. Um, yeah, I'm generally, for those who know me, I'm generally on the farm, but uh, there's a 20 second lag, seems to be as of lately. So, staying late at work, my kind of day job, I guess one would call it. And we are not, okay. One second. My page up isn't working. Does anybody know how to scroll backwards? You should just be able to scroll back. You can put in a page number and hit return. Yeah, page one. How's that sound? Good. Okay. I, uh, the title of my presentation is The Trends in Adolescent Interconnectedness in Relation to Online Technology. Uh, it's changed like three or four times over the course of the last couple months. My, my big slam in the beginning was eye disorders, and then it changed over to the trends. And uh, this is, it's a more of a relationship thing now of how adolescents use technology in their personal relationships. I have oodles of pages, and uh, some of you know I might have about 20 more pages uh, left to really do my conclusion on this, and we're running a little over 100 pages now, but there is a lot of graphs. Uh, I'll do a few things here in the beginning and then jump over to the relationship part, because uh, I have an overview section of like, 30 pages, like similar to the ones in front of you, that just shows trends of where the, we are back in 2005, where we are. Well, this this one graph, uh, we used Pew Research for most all of our data. We did a little bit on Gallup poll, but as you see here, this is a Pew, free Pew Research slide. Uh, you can see the bump there in 2006, and for you folks, I'm pretty sure you know that that was the year that Facebook took off. So anybody under the, over the age of 13 could have an account. So that took off there. And that was also back in the heyday of MySpace. Now here's another, when Pew Research did their, they changed their format in 2015. So anything from 2005 to like 2012, they asked certain questions. And after, that's why we have different groupings and different slides. After 2012 to 2018, there are different groups of questions and they use more trending. So anything up to 2015 was kind of more of an isolated type question just for that year thing. I mean, I believe they knew it was going to be something that last for a while, but they really didn't do trending type exact same questions, exact same way until 2012. That's why all the graphs start there, and some of them start in 2005. Uh, this year, just 2018, a couple of them, people wouldn't think of as YouTube at 73%. Uh, they've never been on it before, but if anybody goes on, well, 73% of people go on, so I'm assuming you folks go on it a little bit. It's becoming a big social media area. Snapchat's never been on before. Snapchat's been around quite some long time. What's up? What's app, I mean? I don't know how familiar you are with, with that. That's more of a southwestern urban app, and it comes right in at 22% on its first year. Well, it's been around for a while, but it hasn't really made Pew. Pew kind of picked seven up until just recently. It's always picked seven social media sites that it uses to let people choose from. And as we'll see, we get later when they were asking the kids, in their section, what, you know, what is your technology? Video chatting is something that's really taken off lately, especially with the data being cheaper than it was, but it was never included because they never thought it was something, and now, of course, it is something. Uh, here's the age breakouts. 
I have some verbiage on most all these slides over here. I could just read it off to you, but that would get a little dry. So this first part is basically just an overview, a little support before we get into the meat and potatoes. So this is just a breakdown. A lot of the meat and potatoes reference back to here as information that it derived from here. So it's not like there's a lot of information. Well, there's a lot of information there, but not a lot of thought here, just information. This it shows that 94% use YouTube in the age range. Facebook, people over 55, everybody uses it. Snapchat, uh, you'll see sometimes the vines will be here, Tumblr will be here, things that no longer. Here's a, here's the thing. Um, we'll get into this in real detail in a little while, but several times a day, the Facebook, a lot of people just don't go to Facebook. They go somewhere else first and then build themselves to it. And I'm just doing a little recap right now. and We'll get into details in a second. Uh, like when they want to talk to each other, say, or they want a game, which we'll get into a section on gaming. You know, I'll just sit down in front of the Facebook and wait for somebody to show up to instant message, or they don't sit in front of the game console just waiting for one of their friends to show up. They There's a whole routine. There's a Snapchat section that says, hey, you know, you're there, I love you, or, you know, whatever words they use for that particular friend that they have. And then it goes that to a text. Text, hey, what are you doing tonight? What time's good? And then it all builds. So a lot of these sites are used throughout the day to build their strategy to getting where they want to be, whether it be instant messaging, whether it be to hang out at somebody's house, which is still a very viable thing that teenagers do, which me going into this initially, I didn't see. I'm clicking on two different screens. So the one on my left I'm getting my notes off of is not moving my screen. So there we go. Here's a little screen on, I can never pronounce this word correctly, reciprocal. Yes. I can't say it because somebody else uses it a lot. And uh, so I don't, I'll try not to use it. But as you'll see, a lot of the people migrate back and forth between different platforms. Some of them migrate well, some of them don't migrate well. And if you get it, into the depth of the material we'll be getting into shortly, you'll see like Pinterest, the people there don't go into WhatsApp because it's a different demographic. You have more of the older teenage girls, um, the early 20 somethings, they don't go over and, and go on to, or they go on to YouTube, but they don't go on WhatsApp. Is, is anybody familiar with WhatsApp or is it just me that was, to me, it was new to me. Oh, I it, just it's a, Yeah. Okay. So it was just new to me. A lot of the kids have it here. Yeah. Um, but the, it's a Wi-Fi video voice system. And that's more of a younger generation. It goes more towards the Hispanic population where you have your Pinterest or the older girls. Uh, it's generally a white demographic. And so quite a lot of the Facebook, Instagram stuff will migrate back and forth between the different platforms. And then there's other platforms that do migrate somewhat, but there's some of them that just, they just don't meet for whatever reason. Uh, like LinkedIn, we have LinkedIn there, which basically the demographic there is college graduates. I mean, you're not gonna migrate well to, you know, as you say, the WhatsApp or the Snapchat, people that go to LinkedIn to Snapchat, it, it's just not there. Of course, we'll get in, I, probably we won't have a chance to get into all of this, but we'll touch base on this a little bit that the, I just lost my train of thought wherever it went. It'll come back or not, I don't know. So we'll just move on. If it comes back, it does. If it doesn't, it wasn't that important anyways. Uh, this is a cue, um, the negative side. We don't stay on the negative side too much because there's a lot of positive out there that people would find it very hard to give this up. Now you need it. If you look at these first few slides, these first few slides come out of 
the breakdown in social media because the, the teenager section, see this is like the 18 to 50, the, the older groups, and then I have some other groups here that, um, but in the older groups, the younger generation find it very hard. It's part of them, it's part of an extension of their body, um, as you folks would call them, digital natives. So it's not so much a tool, it's just an extension of a way for them to be able to talk to each other, uh, to, to be able to connect to the people. We'll hit a, a quick one here. This is the total demographics used by Pew uh, to figure, I started using uh, SPSS and uh, everything that I was trying to do, they had already did and theirs looks so much nicer than mine. So I go, this is just goofy. I'll probably get points off or whatever, but that's how that, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit. Snapchat, I'm not sure how I'm gonna escape here real quick because I don't wanna stay too long on this because this is basically, all these here, this is just graphics and I have the verbiage down here and that's all on Google, uh, Google Drive along with this, all this information here on, what do you call it? I have a document on all this. But I, I want to come up here to the starting of the meat and potatoes type stuff, which is really what this is about. There we go. It's about friendships. It's about closeness. It's about being able to connect with those. Uh, I was surprised about how many people actually make new friends. We'll go through the demographics here a little bit on this. But as it says here, uh, of all teens, 20% have made a new friend online. Uh, depending on your demographics may be different how you feel. You see, like older teen boys are more likely to have a new friend online. Or a younger girl, <clears throat> excuse me, would not. If you were a parent of a young girl, you might be happy with that. I, I think I would. I mean... If I have, I have three young, well, they're not young anymore, but three sons and, you know, if people were calling them up, making friends on, it a lot has to do with how it's presented and we'll keep moving into this. Okay, uh, a lot of the gamers will get in, there's a whole section on gaming. A lot of people don't consider gaming part of the whole social media, but as we'll see, a lot of, gamers actually get on every single day with their friends so they they come home the teenagers get home they do their chores they do their homework then eight nine to ten o'clock at night they'll sit down for an hour or so with their friends and play a game and they did they voice chat while they're doing this and that's part of the whole and and they also have new friends a lot of more of the rural population we'll look at the stats in here in a second are more apt to make friends online and there's also an economic thing for people under the age under the household income of 30k make more friends online than those over 75k so if your household is over 75k when your kids go online it's very very likely that they're playing with friends from school or from church or synagogue or wherever because Numbers just don't lie, and that's how how that rolls. But the everyday gamers are very likely to make 37 percent. 37 percent of everyday gamers have made five or, or more friends. And I just clicked it up there. And there's social media. The one we just looked at was gaming. Uh, there's a lot of different sections. A lot of people use the name social media for everything that the kids do online or what we do online, but you folks in the industry know that social media is just considered a platform designed with a site to exchange media of some sort. Now here's the 61% of the social media people of friends. Now these are kids, remember this, the first section of the group we looked at, uh, we didn't go through all 50 of those slides, 
were adults from the age of 18 to over 50, 75. There's, depending on which graph you look at, shows different demographics and breakdowns. Now, this grouping we're looking through here on the relationship part as we had jumped ahead, this is all from 13 to 17. This is considered middle adolescence. And so my report in this respect centers on mid-adolescence 13 to 17. And see, we see a breakdown here. When you make uh, friends of online video games, very big for the boys. Uh, social media, big for the girls, all teens. And you, you can see how it ranges. The discussion sites, uh, and you can see the young girls and young boys, it's, they're very unlikely to make new friends in certain places. Discussion sites, uh, blogging sites, Tumblr, I, I probably wouldn't want my young kids finding friends there, but people do find friends there. I mean, you, everybody has their, that's what's nice about the internet is it'll say later, is there's something out there for everybody. You think growing up in the world, you're the only person that has that thought or whatever in your head, and you find out there's a whole world out there that likes, you know, cats with no hair or something. We'll use that as an example. That's a pretty safe example. Now, there is a lot of breakdowns by authenticity. As you can see, there is a stream where folks that have a smartphone are more tend to text, while those who do not are more likely to have social media. So there's a there's an economic, there's a authenticity, there's an education level, all those demographics come in, and you can pretty much follow them through in a line to say, okay, black teens are more apt to make more friends on social media, while Hispanic are more likely to make friends playing a video game. That's just, uh, just the way the numbers roll. I don't think it means anything, or maybe it does. If I was an advertiser, I would definitely would like to know those. Okay, now this is a <laughs> this is another funny thing. A lot of these people that make friends, people their kids make friends on the internet, whether it be gaming or social media, and I'm sure you have heard it in the news. They'll cross states to go meet this friend, their new friend. Some of it's all above board. You know, on a lot of the few surveys and research, they had a group survey to get together and have, they ask questions. It's not a survey, it's an interviews. And a lot of the interviews with the kids, a lot of the times that they've had friends online for years and something happens, they meet each other, it, the word, the word that's used the most is weird. It, it always ends up being weird, meeting a friend, a longtime online friend. And other ones, say it's great, it works out, but uh, eight out of 10 people or kids that have met people online use the word weird. John, um, um, we're, we're kind of running out of time. I yeah, um, sorry. was wondering what your research questions are. I wasn't quite clear on that. I haven't gotten anything in the 599 class so far from you. So I, I just was wondering what your research questions and what your um, theories are that you're going to be applying. Um, it's going through here of closeness. I've been able to feel, I'll get over here to this. Um, about feeling, the, the thought of feeling as it comes about. I have, I have an abstract I wrote and I was tweaking a little bit during the last conversation, but it, it's about feeling, you're feeling closer. You feel closer to the person's life. You feel closer to uh, a relationship you're having. 
uh, I have a bunch of of ways that they a lot of teenagers feel. So Don, that, I've got a question for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love the Pew Data stuff. Um, have you looked at like Dana Boyd's work on um, the social life of teens? I think it's called It's It's Complicated. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, so you've looked at, and then um, what's the other one? The um, the Alone Together book? Yes. So could, yep. you, could you tell us about how some of those ideas are illustrated maybe in this kinds of data? And, um, and maybe if you could show us the abstract that you're working on, that would be helpful too. Okay. Let me um, bounce over here, see if I can... Okay, that this uh, I guess you guys can see that right there, right? Yep. Um, so small. I've button. never written an abstract before, but this was basically the initial thoughts that I had. It's about the. Uh, I can read it for you, or you can read it yourselves. Got it. Yeah. Internet, so, yeah, the gaming on and off the internet, and it's the comparing. Adolescents cannot get enough of each other. That is, if they keep each other in distance, they can control. Adolescents are sacrificing conversation for connection. If they don't have a con connection, a lot of them don't feel like themselves. Uh, the devices, some of these devices are so powerful that it makes them change who they are. Right, so you, you basically, so if you, you, you basically want to write a, um, like a think piece on this. You're not going to collect any of your own data and you're not going to build something. So you sort of want to write like a reflection based on our current way of thinking about this topic. Is that right? Yeah, I have, um, where is it over here? See, I'll, I'll jump this over here. This is my document that goes, see what I did is I just put stuff together for slides. So here's all your yeah, I get Here's that. your slide, and then I have a breakdown of all the the which of how everything affects each other. So, and how it pulls all into the theme. But you're not gonna, yeah, exactly. But you're not gonna reinterpret data. You're not running data. You're not gonna get their data set and generate your own analysis. So it's all it's it's all what we call secondary analysis. Correct. I, I started to do that, but every time I did it, I found somewhere where they had already done it. So, I mean, their information's out there. A lot of their information that I had to use to talk about adolescents has been out there since 2015. And there's, I was really, you know, there was no graph or anything that I was going to pull together that was going to be new, that was going to, you know, because well, they looked at everything and always, everything I mean, there's possibilities but no there's always something new you could do but you're not going to you're not going to get the pew data set and do your own analysis and ask different questions with their data then so you kind of so we should think of a strategy for how you would do a a secondary analysis usually what we do with the secondary analysis is part of the project becomes generating an output you know, that's like a, a, it's a spin or an interpretation on somebody else's data. Um, and so we'd want that, and then that gets designed. Um, so we have to think about how, what the project would be. So, um, yeah, I, my, I, big, I kind of agree with you quite seeing what it is that you're doing quite. The, the big, well, I'm not doing anything new that hasn't been done before. And that's, and, and that unfortunately is the problem when you're working with somebody else's data that's that, um, you know, public. You know, um, one, I mean, every, a lot of times you can get answers to this through a, a really good literature review because that sort of directs you and shows the theories that they used and then you can use those. Um, what's important is not to worry if someone else did something already, it's that it's your analysis. You know, don't, 
don't get hung up on whether some everything's been done in the world because you're you're doing it and that's what makes it you know yours um but I, I do think it's important, uh, you know, Steve mentioned a couple of texts. Um, I think that's where you want to start. <clears throat> you know, what sort of theory did they use? What sort of analysis? What sort of, uh, you know, understandings did they come up with that maybe uh, can help drive you in a different way? Yeah, um, actually, initially it did drive me in a different way because my, my thought was, um, like you was reading there in the Gallup poll, everybody had friends, 10 friends apiece, you know, back in 2006, and now each person has two friends. Um, so I was going into the negative direction, and I, I actually came out much more in a positive direction. And uh, and some of the other people, like your Sherry Turkle, you, you read her book and everything was so positive, positive, she gets her face on the front of Wired, you know, I read those articles. And then you listen to her TED talk and she goes, everything that I, you've read about me or I projected, forget about it. That's wrong because all that stuff I wrote that it was so great is, is not good. Is, is, you know, she was, you know, she was writing books five years ago saying how great things are. Now well, she's right. She was writing books 30 years ago. So showing how great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, now she's saying, that's, you know, that are, that's a theme. If you want to talk about that, that's a really cool argument to make. And let's think about like where you would place that kind of a piece. You know, if it's a, a magazine, then let's design it. Let's design your piece to sort of fit a model. Um, you know, I think it would be good if it were visual, you know, had some visual aspects to it. And so we think about length and stuff, but you know, maybe it's a, you know, it's like it's an opinion piece that's going to go to Wired magazine. You, you know what I mean? So let's let's develop like an output that you imagine, and then try to design to that. Because I think you've got a you've got an argument. We just have to, you know, weld it together somehow and make it into a project that or and and a deliverable. We need something that you're going to produce, um, like a monograph or something. So. Um, I think taking a look at some of the thesis projects that have already been done might be helpful. We did that one last semester. I think Steve, you might remember the um, that was a set of essays on a given topic. Yeah. Um, and then some students might think like, given the fact that your theme is about relationships with adolescents and social media, would you want to create something that would um, educate teens and make them interested in this kind of data? Or would you want to do, a, you know, a module of a class that you're teaching on this? Or um, there, you know, our students have so many creative and interesting ideas. Just looking at the, um, the repository might be helpful for you to see how you can um, envision what that output would be. Yeah, I um, I was going to say, like, just to give you an example, there's a, 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 a lot of recent research showing that guys, because you have some stuff about boys <clears throat> doing a lot more in terms of gaming, there, there's a lot of discussion lately about guys sort of dropping out. It's called, there was a TED Talk called The Demise of Guys, and it's just sort of this idea that guys are sort of getting into their own world of video games. I don't know if that's an area you want to go into, but I mean, it's sort of one way to take this. Like, like where is this leaving us? Where, how is this maybe changing or, you know, um, giving us indications of where our society is headed? You know, even if it's just your take on it. And I think that's sort of where you're going. You know, you're talking about friendships. So what do we see from all this? You know, all these numbers and data and pie charts, what do you see? What, what sort of trends are you seeing from all this? Sort of just sort of write them down and see if there's any connections between them. <clears throat> you know, like they're finding that PTSD is much higher in guys and that, um, you know, their dropout rates are higher because when you take the, this group and you send them through a traditional college system, they tend to struggle. <clears throat> um, but, 
But, you know, look at the literature and see if there's something that drives you in some direction that says, aha, you know, this is, this is what this means in terms of one way to look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, see how, if there's a, a direction that can take you. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it's very hard to do that when you're, when you're not, when you're, when you're rehashing some, I mean, a lot of the stuff here, I, I, I felt like I really wasn't accomplishing anything, even though I wrote, you know, 75 pages of words, um, because it's all somebody else's graph and there's somebody else's numbers. You know what I'm saying? And without being able to interface directly, it, it's to come up with the, you know, original thoughts. What do you mean interface directly? Like to talk to kids. Oh, okay. You know, but, you know, like to ask, to gather your own data and ask them, that you, you could do that. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Well, see, I, I already did that back in 2017 and 2015, well, and I was going to build There's something preventing you from using that data, agreed. Okay, because that was, you know, you know, yeah. So a lot of the thoughts are still in my brain because, you know, I've read the data and I've looked at the trends. But as far as being able to use, to reference them and, well, you can you can download and analyze all of the Pew data, and you have like an amazingly rich data set to play in if that's what you want to do. Um, I've I've already did you know I've I've looked at all the raw data that was presented from Pew, um, and they call it the top line, and I, I did look through all that. Right. But the the one raw data that they didn't that they don't seem to give is okay you have you know it says okay rural boys do this and you know boys 13 years old do this girls that are 19 years old do this but to be able to get like a hispanic girl that's 13 years old that lives in the country and then and comparing her to all those other people that have the exact uh demographic that stuff's not really it's not that raw that I could find. Yeah, you have to download the SPSS, the data files, and I, I, and run. I, I did this. It, it's all there. Okay. So, I, mean, you have I the, guess they give you the raw data. You can't get more than what that. That's the raw questionnaire data. You, you, and you might be able to do it in spread in in Excel if you don't do SPSS, or you can download a. You know, you can get SPSS for students. It's not terribly complicated to use. I mean, it, there's a learning curve, um, but you might. I think you'd find that interesting because then you'd be generate. Then you'd be asking exactly the questions you want to ask, and you can see how things change over time. You, all you can do now is look through the things that they've thought were interesting. So I get your frustration. Yeah, I don't mean to be argumentative. I just, um, you know, it's all everything that I was doing ended up already being done you know what I mean because a lot of the a lot of the stuff on the you know like we like you said earlier you know a month ago uh, those questions that I had asked those kids back in 2015 and 2017 they're in here Pew asked the exact same questions right and that's and that's those, those questions I showed here on on spreadsheets I mean I can't do trends so well but you can't but do it, it's, you, you, I can do trend I could do the trends they did not they did not put together the trends and I did not have enough education and that's, I did some tutorials on SPSSs and I did not I did not pull it all together enough to be able to do trends outside of what they had already done right you know, this is where theory would help you, I think, enormously. It would show you what to look for. It seems like you're just looking, to some extent, off the top of your head to see what you find. If, if you can find some uh, social theory 
to drive this, then that would help you decide what to look at. Um, and scholarship is all about theory. Um, you know, I think Dave was a perfect example. He just, everything he was talking about had to do with different theories that he was applying, you know, anything from, you know, uh, in, in all sorts of areas. I wrote some of them down, but he, you know, he sort of was, like he talked about closure in new ways that I hadn't even thought of before. And, and he dealt with sort of uh, his, his data points in, in new ways. So I, I would sort of try to find some social theory and then apply it perhaps in a new way. Because I think the problem is if you just keep looking, you're not driven in a, in a direction, you're just looking. And that'll sort of lead you the areas that have already been dis discussed. Um, but I think you have to start with the literature. You have to sort of uh, not, you, you may have to get away from Pew for a little bit and just see what's been written about Pew and how they've studied it. And that'll show you, or about their research rather, and that hopefully will lead you to some theories that now you can use in different ways because this is just the output, it's not the analysis. The analysis would be, you know, papers that have been written about this. <clears throat> so um, hopefully you've got something to think about there and you can, you know, s start taking this in new directions. Um, Did you submit a one to two pager, Don? I, I don't recall. Did I miss? The you one know? to two pager on? On what you want to do. You know, usually there's a, the theories, the uh, research questions. Um, Back but, in the beginning of the class, yes. Yeah. So it's supposed to be the type of thesis research, what you want to know, what are your outcomes, what do you want to do? research questions, theory, methods, that sort of thing. So you, you did that, I, I, don't, I couldn't find it quickly anyway, but, but I think that's where you wanna start. You know, you wanna almost back up a little bit. Yeah, that was all, um, I'm looking at it right now. That was all about the study on the wave, the the direction, where things are going, the you know the trends, and that was about well, it was all about feeling. It was all about how do you feel compared to face to face when you talk to somebody, and, and that was. But yeah, so that that was all. I think that's why we often um, start with the literature review about a 10 page, 10, 12 pager, because that will help you, um, you know, see what's already been done about this, see what's missing, and probably help you focus a little bit. So I would suggest that might be a next um, step. And we'd be happy to, you know, help you with that, look through it and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you could even start by looking at, you know, those terms you've been using, you know, friendship, uh, research, uh, social media, uh, start thinking of, of all your keywords that you're curious about, and then see what articles have been written. Uh, most of them you'll throw out, but some may hopefully be more, less of a, a just description of what was found and more of an analysis and where that's taking us. So if you can, you know, start with those keywords, and I'm sure, um, you know, Dr. Stam, Dr. Schneider, and I can try to give you some ideas for that, but that, that should start. Then you'll find some, maybe two papers that are perfect, and now you've got all of their work that they, you know, that they've cited, and that'll give you a hundred other articles. So all you need is to find one or two. And then that'll drive you and, and totally, you know, give you lots more. 
Yeah, I read a whole bunch of them on the connectedness or whatever that word is there, and okay. a lot on eye disorders, a lot on depression type stuff initially because that was how I was going to the the direction I was going initially. Okay, well, you may want to you know redo that now that you're you're thinking in different areas. Um, but you'll have to sort of see what works for you. And, and, and you know, that lit review, I think I'll get you started on that. Um, before I forget though, um, can, uh, James, can you try, oh, Shannon's there. Okay, so we're ready for the next one. And I, I haven't seen um, Joseph 